you again for joining us here on the Shaman's Way podcast. If you have any questions, would like to make a request for a future episode, or if you're looking for other shamanic resources, including free drumming tracks, please visit us at shamansway.net. Until the next episode, be well, everyone. Hello everyone and welcome back to Shaman's Way podcasts. I want to talk this evening or today, I don't know when you're listening, to Curses Part 2. I've had a good response in regards to the Curse podcast that I did some time ago and it was asked if I could do a follow-up regarding perhaps some of my experiences and perhaps what I believe will help with regard to what you're doing in helping yourself or helping people around you. But I want to talk more in depth regarding the relationship of our life and the relationship of curses in our life one of the questions I postulated and I had no response for was how come some people are affected by curses and some people are not affected by curses. So I think that in order to best understand this I want to talk about past life wounds and present life problems. If you are not someone who accepts the um, possibility of past lives, then bear with me as I speak about this and perhaps something of what I say will resonate even if you don't particularly have a belief in past lives. And if you have a relationship with some of your past lives or you understand some of your past lives, perhaps what I present to you will give you some, oh yeah, that makes total sense, and some aha moments. Past life issues that carry into the current life are often thought of as being a result of various effects. We have all heard the word of karma. We're going to talk about curses, so family curses, and spiritual attachments. Wounds and unhealed traumas we have experienced in past lives, in my experience, journeying through this number of years, these contribute greatly to our current life experience and they constitute a large part of our present experience. To understand how past life wounds impact us in the present, I want to look at how trauma affects the psyche in our current life. A traumatic event, really it's any overwhelming experience that you have, whether that is physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual. What this does is it causes an inability in the psyche to integrate that experience fully and continue in the same manner as before the traumatic event was experienced. The trauma leaves lasting and damaging impressions and these can manifest as a combination of symptoms such as chronic disassociation, anxiety, phobias, fears, hypervigilance, inhibitions, paranoia, neuroses, avoidance, armoring or rigidity, suppression of emotions, emotional, even physical numbness, mental confusion, compulsions. I know I named off quite a few, but those are really very few in relationship when we talk about the psychology and the health of the psyche, of the psyche in and of itself. In psychological languages, combinations of these symptoms 
are classified as post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress syndrome, so PTSD or PTSS. One of the authors that inspired me is Dr. Peter Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E, and he was the author of Waking a Tiger, Healing Trauma. What he expounded is that PTSD symptoms were caused by frozen residue of energy that was not discharged or resolved when the person was threatened. The natural flight or fight response is activated when an individual is faced with a threat. We, I think we can all pretty much have that relationship to fight or flight. I think we've all pretty much experienced that fight or flight response. If a person is overwhelmed or defeated, as in they can't fight or escape, or defeated, as in they can't fight or escape, the natural response becomes a frozen impulse, an action that was never completed. And I think, from my perspective, working many times with soul retrieval, curse removal, and working to heal the trauma, I, I often tell people that we um, are flighting, we're, we have a frozen effect, we have a flight effect, we have an avoidant effect, but many of us don't consider that we're frozen in our anxiety or that we're frozen emotionally. The potential to develop PTSD varies from person to person, but when it does take hold, the physiology of the person changes, as does the psychological state. Oftentimes what happens is we can't integrate the memory of trauma properly. Psychologically, he becomes split off and stays, in essence, frozen in time. And we might refer to this as soul loss, or what I often experience as opposed to direct soul loss is I see when I go to journey, I see the soul of the person half in and half out of their body. So it doesn't split off, but it remains attached to the body, but not fully within the body, ensconced or embraced or integrated. This is what I think of as fragmentation. This part of the psyche separates from the ego structure, and it remains that way. And when these fragments are encountered, encountered in past or present, you know, whether we're going through past life regression or through inner journeying work, these aspects seem to have a life of their own. The fragments appear to be the same age as when they were split off, and often they don't have an awareness that life has moved. And often they don't have an awareness that life has moved on. Many times in soul retrieval work, I will convince the soul piece that has broken off that there is an adult waiting on the other side to welcome them in and keep them safe. It's, that, it's not that very uncommon at all. If they are aware of the present day personality, sometimes they're reluctant to be a part of it. The difference between conscious and subconscious memories is a matter of the perception of chronological time. The conscious mind perceives time as changing or moving from the past through the present to the future. To the subconscious mind, memories, especially the traumatic ones, retained there are happening in the now, which is, I think, part of the reason why things are triggered happening in the now. Trauma becomes the soil that the psyche uses to sow the seeds that can potentially grow so big it inhibits healthy behavior and growth. I'll use an example. I lived in a very chaotic house with a mentally ill mother who was prone to sudden violent outbursts, not a house to feel safe in. My trauma had trapped me. When I had my first soul retrieval, I know I've talked about this a couple of times, I found my four-year-old self and it had disassociated. I found it in a bedroom with the door closed. I was left in there. I was forgotten and it, essentially I was hidden. I was initially unaware that there was an adult self. All I was aware of was the room I was in and how high the handle was. 
because I was too young and because I was too young and too small to escape my mother. The inability to complete the fight or flight response caused me to fragment. I know that my years of shamanic journeying is what enabled me to reintegrate with the present day adult me. Um, in order to integrate and in order for that four-year-old, three-year-old part of myself to feel safe, I had to make three promises. I would not get angry so fast, I had to learn patience, and I had to learn how to laugh. Keeping those promises helped me experience huge changes. I think of it as returning new potential energy to fire me in the present. In essence, a trauma is a scar that won't seem to heal. This scar then becomes a weak or becomes a weak or a vulnerable spot in the psyche. And it seems to attract to it similar experiences over and over. I wanted to explore personally if this was the case with curses. I had a feeling that we are products of not only this life trauma, but perhaps this trauma sticks to us and we have the wound template per se. Do we find ourselves reenacting the whole trauma or aspects of it without conscious awareness that we are doing so? We, I, th I think most of us, if we sat and looked at it, we can all uh, think patterns in our lives or we can recognize patterns that we have long wanted to at the very least understand and at the very most cease. Freud had a term for this. He called it repetition compulsion. He initially theorized that this is the psyche's attempt to heal by recreating the event symbolically or in actuality the psyche is attempting to gain mastery, even completion. The idea of repetition compulsion that applies to a trauma experienced during a single lifetime also makes sense in a longer timeline, so over many lives of the soul. It would seem that the soul over the course of many lifetimes attempts to heal by recreating in essence or in actuality traumas experienced in the past. And I know Edgar Casey talked quite a bit about this. I believe uh, Michael, the, the channel being Michael, also talked a lot about this. There are, I mean, I could talk about karma, which mean literally means act. There are, I mean, I could talk about karma, which mean, literally means actions. Many of those actions come from deep impressions of habit. But this is called samskara, and I'm going to get it a little bit into the Eastern tradition. And I don't want to go off on the Eastern tradition, but I really, I, I have a relationship to the word samskara. And that it, samskara is intrinsically tied into the laws of karma. And these govern the cycle of rebirth. So, Curses and traumas may not be so far-fetched. Trauma leaves an imprint, and these imprints have the potential. That doesn't mean they do, or they are, or they will, but they have the potential to continually recreate the original traumatic event. Perhaps we can take a look at why some have the ability to create and recreate an ethical and spiritual explanation of why trauma imprints to re-manifest from life to life. Spirit explained it to me as keyholes. Our subtle bodies are passed down in our lives. And if the keyhole finds a key, voila, we have a pattern. After soul retrievals and extractions, there are journeys involved to heal the subtle body so that the keyholes are, if not erased, they're changed or moved so that we don't have the relationship to the key or the keys that trigger those behaviors or those patterns are less likely to find us. These keyholes I have come to understand as the soul continuing to create from its own wounded place an ongoing effort to heal. 
Keys open ongoing effort to heal. Keys open doors, and doors are passageways. And passageways have inherent in them the capacity to once again recreate that very experience which originally opened it. Our past life physical, emotional, and mental bodies are not wiped clean in between lives, but continue to recreate themselves in each incarnation through our subtle bodies. It's a transmission of past physical, emotional, and mental wounds which constitute a large part of what we are meant to heal in our present lives. I have to ask myself the question of how do I, as a wounded healer, how do I understand the nature of my own woundedness if I don't seek to find the source? Looking for patterns during my healing sessions, I noticed that besides the repetitive nature of trauma, the thoughts, feelings, and attitudes that were formed also dictate how future is created from the present and past. It is the attitudes are the imprints we carry that are in need of change and healing. In Curse Removal, we explore how we are not disconnected from our past as we realize energy cannot be lost or created. So if any of this has spoken to you, I suggest that you feel emotion, manifest talents, think thoughts, and are limited by fears repetitively. We often act this out without consciously knowing we're doing so, simply because we are unaware. When we use, when I've used shamanic journey, I want to encounter my samskara as a character or a personic personification of my own energetic self. To, this helps me negotiate with it, bring resolution and healing the complexes so that it ceases to affect my current life. Samskaras are the characters that we're encountering, encountering have resonant stories with a similar theme. In my journeys, I've worked with clusters of similar past lives that emerge from a soul's history. They're connected by the same theme, yet may each reflect a different facet or aspect. For example, a man may find himself a slave in a past life where the theme or personal imprint is one of hopelessness. If we are exploring the personal theme of hopelessness, several past life, past life stories may arise that carry different aspects of how this was imprinted. The circumstances may change through lifetimes in which hopelessness became a part of each life. In one life, it may be because of slavery in another life, it may be because of feeling trapped in an arranged or loveless marriage where he feels like a slave. Or in another instance, he may be a hardworking farmer and the sole provider of a large family or community and a blight comes and, and kills the crops. In the slave scenario, he may die with the idea that there's no way out and quite literally this may be true. In the marriage, he may simply feel trapped and some commit suicide out of depression. The farmer may come to the end of that life feeling that no matter what I do, the odds are against me and I've done compassionate depossession. I have over the years run into three farmers and the farmers have more of an attachment to land than they do to the essence of God or moving up to the light and they were so immersed within the land and when the land was unable to produce or unable to support the farmer had a sense of depression so strong that there was suicide in two of the three cases but in all three cases the suffering beings during the compassion depossession didn't want to ascend to heaven or go anywhere else. They wanted to re-merge with the land. They wanted their 
their souls to merge with that which is ever growing, ever changing, ever evolving, which which is out of the earth. I don't have an evolving, which which is out of the earth. I don't have an explanation as to why. I don't have an explanation as to whether that soul ever reincarnates or anything along those lines. I only know that this is where this is where the souls went. All these different lives will be connected and recalled by an exploration of what is called, what I call the core theme. These core themes are present in our current life and are noticed by examining recurring patterns of behavior. This is one way that the samskaras reveal themselves in our present life. So again, we're going to go back to you know the idea of the samskara as resonant stories with a similar theme and samskaras are characters, personifications of our energetic self and we can negotiate with the samskara to bring resolution and healing to our complexes so that this ceases to life. A few simple questions will open the door to streams of past life imprints. So finish this sentence. I always dot 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 or I never dot dot dot. One could answer I always have to do it alone or I never have enough money. Sometimes we even make casual comments when describing our feelings that are loaded with past life imagery such as I feel like a slave or my hands are tied or I've been stabbed in the back or there's no way out. These are repetitive themes. We take this as actual truth and that shapes our reality and they are most likely core themes that past life characters are still unresolved with. They're changeable but they're so darn familiar that one can't even conceive that it might be possible. That one can't even conceive that it might be possible. Now when I talked about curses before, I talked about archaeologists and the term defixions and defixions, the ones we find were made of metal and inscribed on them are curses or messages to the gods or the spirits of the place to hurt or harm or bind in energy. Physically they can vary somewhat, however generally they're rolled up. No one can assume this would be, one can assume I mean, this could be a physical binding or magical binding. They're often pierced with an iron or a bronze nail. One can assume this is to stake the curse or to make it more painful or it could be extra binding. Some defections have a certain number of holes that make me conclude that the more elaborate the artifact, the more... How did they do that? When they looked at the defections in close proximity, they would find similar handwriting, similar symbols, and similar words. I talked about the curses, the defections being found in graves or graveyards, being, you know, that miasma, that, that smell, that underground magic. Graveyards, they're often very chthonic. They are of or to relating to the lower world. To bury defixions in graveyards would appeal to the spirits of the lower world. So they've been found in graves and they've been found in graveyards. They've also been found in places near watering holes or wells. Curses were often left in places of relevance to the curse recipient. However, water has been an essential element in many myths. An essential element in many myths. And water is fundamental to creating and sustaining life. As a result of this, water is often symbolically regarded as the Great Mother or the Prima Materia, the universal womb, the ultimate source of life. Water-related spirits and goddesses celebrate the vitality of water and its status as a source of life. Water spirits express the dual nature of water. Water sprites were tempters of evil, embodying water's life-giving and destructive properties. We have the Sirons in, in Greek mythology, so as one example. So water is envisioned dualistically. 
emerging either as a shy nymph or dangerous luring creatures. Washing was, with water was also cremation, metamorphosis. And although water itself may contain the power to bring about change, it serves as the medium through which a god or goddesses or curse can exercise change. Change in the physical transformation or metamorphosis is characteristic of the nature of water. Water is the source of all life, right? It's the source of all life. And it has also the power to drown and destroy. Its paradoxical nature lends to the notion of water, specifically immersion in water as being a return to the primordial state. How do we release ourselves of curses? The very, very first thing I wish to impress upon you is that curses were created with a life force and life force the very, very first thing I wish to impress upon you is that curses were created with a life force. And life force is fuel. And it is still alive and it is still activated. We have discussed or I've discussed cursed objects or possessed objects. And I know that those are different, but the demonologists, the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine Warren, have a museum in their house or on their property that is loaded with possessed and cursed objects, such as Annabelle, such as chairs, such as the dark mirror. There are various aspects of this. In order to remove a curse, the very first thing that you do is you journey to the spirit world and you find a spirit who will be dedicated specifically to helping you remove the curse. It is strongly suggested that you do not remove a curse yourself because you are a living being and you have life force and life force again is fuel it is alive and it is activated in order to remove a curse you don't want to exchange your life force for another life force so trading so what we do is we find a, a person, a spirit, a spirit kin, a power animal, whatever, that has curse originator re undoing the curse and bringing back what is needed in order for the curse to be removed and what is needed in order for the curse, the effects of the curse to be reduced over time or reduced immediately. The journey to find or journey to have that spirit help you is very, very important. So when you have met this being, then you start talking about ways that you're going to track or trace a curse. So you can track or trace a curse by following, let's say you're tracking that person who has no luck. So you are tracking the trail of luck or unluckiness. You start off in the lower world. Is where you start off in the lower world is where I start off. And I start off at the threshold of the, my patient's person. I start off by calling the spirit kin that I work with to remove curses. We trace that particular curse to a curse maker or a professional curse maker at times. Sometimes it is somebody's grandmother. Sometimes it's somebody's grandfather. Generally, we travel through various generations of a family in order to find the originator. I am never allowed to go quote-unquote, behind the curtain to 
take part in, to listen, or to experience what my negotiator says as in order to release that curse. Sometimes there's loud noises. Sometimes there's yelling. I've even had a couple of explosions in my journeys where, and then my curse negotiator will come out and will have a bundle or will have something in his hands and will tell me this curse was started by this, this, or this. And this is what you have to do in order to release the curse. So sometimes very strange things are requested of people. One of the strange ones that I've had is someone was to go out and to buy a very expensive piece of meat and to gather the family around because this whole family was affected by the curse and to gather the whole family around and for this piece of meat to be passed from family member to family member to family member to family member to family member and for each family member to talk into this piece of meat and to say how luck has affected their life. So I've had no luck, I've lost 15 jobs, hand it to the next person. I've had no luck, I was healthy and then struck by a car. I've had no luck, whatever, whatever, whatever. Right? And then at the end, they were to bury the meat under a very old tree. For this person, the and there was a number of other things that they had to do in relation to other, other curses or other aspects of the curse. When they came back to me, they did not have an effect. It did not have an effect on them. And yet, there are other cases where I've done curse removal work and my curse negotiator goes out, comes back, and we, we, and we, we practice the same of this is what the curse was about, this is what you have to do in the real world, and then true and amazing lasting effects have happened for that person. So I go back to my original podcast when I said, Sometimes I don't know why it helps uh, some and doesn't help others. Same as soul retrieval work. How come sometimes some people are very affected and other people are not? I don't have an answer. And if you have an answer, perhaps you can share this with me. I do know that one of the ways of breaking patterns, especially if we're dealing with trauma, we also need to break the pattern of the psychology of that trauma. We need to break the pattern of, instead of saying, ah, I'm so, I feel so alone. Instead of saying that, you phrase it in another man, foo-foo or poo-poo, some of us foo-foo and poo-poo, the knowledge or the positive affirmations are going to change our world. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But I believe that if we do not work with the traumatized psyche, healthy healing will not occur. So the removing a curse is really very simple. The, the most important aspect of curse removal is to find a curse negotiator. Find that curse negotiator. Remember the golden rule. The golden rule is don't exchange your life force for the life force of a curse because that just comes back on you and you give away part of your life force. What are you going to bring back in order to fill that life force? So take my word seriously. If you don't want to, don't. All the power to you. Have fun. See you later. Don't call removal of the curse and following what has to happen in order to manifest a change in this lifetime is very important. The curse originator isn't kidding. The curse originator does not necessarily see that life has evolved and life has moved on. It sees that curse originator only sees that bag of bones or that defixion or that well that it was placed under or whatever it is. That the that that curse originator is stuck within that time frame. We talked about the frozen in anxiety. We talked about the frozen in trauma, the inability to move forward and, and flashbacks. 
But we, when we look in the spirit world, we talk about the worlds as being non-linear. Time is worlds as being non-linear. Time is not linear. So the curse originator is just as fresh the minute your curse negotiator goes to speak with them as the day that that curse negotiator created that curse because you're traveling along the spider web of time and all time is interrelated and all time is interconnected even though that's a huge concept and quantum physics may or may not bear this out eventually but this has been my experience. The most important aspects of working with this is I like to, when we go with the samskara, if you're doing the journey work or you want someone to do the journey work on your behalf, I ask that you look for the samskara could be in the face of that inner diviner that lives within you, the inner healer or the inner warrior. These are your ancestors. I would suggest that you take three small pieces of paper and write on one diviner, one warrior, one healer and fold them up, put them in a container and randomly choose. The intention of the journey is to ask what is it in you that has been handed down from them. I personally was adopted and raised in a foster home so my idea of family is kind of transitory. So learning about family at times proved to be challenging for me and it may also be strange for some of you. In our ancestral line, we have inherited the heritage of the diviner. You know, we all have that one aunt or that one uncle who could read things, who saw things, who knew things. Many of us have healers. How many of our aunts healers? How many of our aunts our uncles or mothers or fathers or sisters or nurses, doctors, medics, midwives. How many of your aunts, uncles, grandfathers or fathers have been warriors who trained in the military, the Navy or the Air Force? You're going to choose one and you're going to track them through time. When you journey to your ancestor, your task is to find out what to do with the gift or the traits given to you. You are to learn how to use them when you're assigned the task of removing the curses from your partner, from yourself, or someone's doing it for you. This helps you to find the spirit that will help you with negotiations to remove the curse of the curses. The negotiator all the way along will be negotiating to get anywhere. The negotiator negotiates with the gatekeeper, the eats with the gatekeeper, the ancestor taking you, the ancestor talking to you, the ropes. This is one of those spiritual healings, again, when your energy cannot be given or taken to break the curse of the curses, mostly because it has nothing to do with you. You and the spirit helping you with negotiating may encounter the curse originator, the counts, the curse creator, and they're not always the same person. They're not always the same person. The curse originator could be someone that your great great times eight grandfather uh, frustrated, and that originator then went to a professional curse creator or went to the local herb person, and they said. I want this person to blah, 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 blah. Professional cursors, people who were really good at curse work, knew what they were doing and had relationships with spirits that could, that's one of the differences between, you know, the curses that are done today as opposed to the curses that were done in the past. I think we're dealing with different levels of professionalism and different levels of knowledge and awareness of the spirits, the spirit world, and the tools of the trade. I'm not knocking present day cursors. I'm not knocking present day uh, individuals, but what I'm suggesting is that individuals who are raised with a knowledge and with knowing what their life path is going to be have worked their entire life in that life path and being a curse professional cursor could be just one tool within the toolkit of that particular individual. There are many examples 
of curses that I have experienced in my life. But what I wanted to do in the fall, there are many examples of curses that I have experienced in my life. But what I wanted to do in the follow-up podcast on curses is give you some of my thoughts on trauma, how and why we bring trauma through our lifetimes, how and why trauma can affect us, and what are some of the ways that we can keep ourselves safe when we are journeying through the spirit world in order to remove a curse for somebody. I do think it is important to have a relationship or discuss your gifts with of your diviner self, your healer self, and your warrior self, because those aspects of you, those gifts, can very well come in handy when you are in the process of attempting to change something, not only in yourself, only in yourself, but perhaps something in somebody else. So, if you spoke to your diviner, what is what is this? What is my trait that I have? Well, you have really good things with dreams, and I've always been a good dreamer, and I've always sent things your way. We have many, many tools, and I'm not usually one that, if you've been practicing for a long time, I don't think we need to continually go out and amass gifts and amass things to bring to us, because I I think that's really seems like a, a something that is of a luxury world, right? If we we always want to accumulate things. Well, it's really nice to accumulate things, but if we don't use our gifts, then what good are our gifts? What what good truly is a gift if you don't use it? What truly good is the ability to do something or to have a knowledge or understanding? So not my thing. And good for you, at least you've learned it. And perhaps you can teach it to somebody else along the way. However, I think that if you are listening to this, it's because you have a curiosity, a relationship, perhaps even a curse yourself that you wish to remove. You can remove your own curses. It's more difficult because, I mean, you're going to use your negotiator. I'm not negating on that. But sometimes it's more difficult if we don't explore our samskara, if we don't explore what our triggers are, what our patterns are, it's very difficult to have a blanket statement such as, uh, I don't want to feel like a slave anymore, which is all well and good. But if you haven't tracked that feeling of hopelessness or that feeling of being tied down or that feeling of depression throughout being tied down or that feeling of depression throughout your lives, I don't think you can really fully understand the tapestry of how that is woven into your life. I think it's very important that we understand how the past affects the now, how the past affects the future, how the past affects you, period. So I encourage you to explore. I encourage you to find someone to do this work with. If you are unable to find someone to do this work with, I encourage you to do this on your own. But I do encourage you to explore your past. I do encourage you to seek one answer at a time. And you may find that one curse has the answer to five things in your life. I don't know. But I really could go on and discuss this at length. However, I am running well past my half hour mark. So I am going to bid you a fond farewell. Thank you always for listening. If you can, leave us a comment on iTunes, on Spotify, whatever your favorite podcast download app is on your computer or on your phone. And feedback is always appreciated. I don't always respond within 24 hours, but I do respond. And I do like to read what is being written. And I certainly do try to get to the questions that are being asked. So I turn this back to my lovely friend, Doug. 
Thank you very much. Thank you again for joining us here on the Shaman's Way podcast. If you have any questions, would like to make a request for a future episode, or if you're looking for other shamanic resources, including free drumming tracks, please visit us at shamansway.net. Until the next episode, be well, everyone.